Hi, that recording in progress is always startling. Um, hi, I'm so happy to be here. Um, and now my face is very large and I will get used to it. It's fine. <laughs> um, so um, I, uh, in the spirit of, uh, you know, the ugly mud transferring to here. Um, I'm gonna read some stuff that I don't often read. Um, so I, I'm gonna read um, one orphan poem that, you know, never has made it into anything that I recently re-encountered. Um, and then an excerpt from um, a lyric essay that I'm working on out of a book of lyric essays and then um, and then a poem out of my most recent book and that uh, Ben, not calling you older than me. Well, we can talk about that later. Um, I don't know which of us is older. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Children at heart. Um, okay. So um, we'll start with this. This is the fidelity of projection. Um, and I just thinking about this poem because thinking about how sort of um, distant and yet connected we've all been over the last year and so that has happened so much online. Um, so this is a fidelity of projection. All the beautiful people go look at the ocean. All the beautiful people go look at the ocean and say it is immense and stunning and makes them feel small, but in a good way. All the beautiful people are not beautiful people in a traditional way, not magazine stand beautiful people, but I envy them anyway. Because they are looking at the ocean and feeling small, but in an adored way, and they seem happy. They know where their hands are. Some of them are holding hands, these non-traditionally beautiful people, and I envy them their solidity, their location, and their photographically apparent joy in admiring it. Their mouths hang open like miniature cranes, the ones that dig huge amounts of things like rocks to lift, but these are empty, except for the teeth. Anyway, they are looking at the ocean and seeming happy. They have rolled up their pants, though their shoes are still on, and the sun is sunny and the rocks are rocky, and one of them looks like he's about to lose lose his balance, but he's okay. All the beautiful people are careless about their beauty, like it's just something they woke up with today, like a hangover or enough toast and jam for five. You can probably tell that I've had a bad day. I'm hungry and I'll probably start bleeding from the vagina this week. These pictures of beautiful people make me simultaneously nostalgic and enraged. I know some of their names. I'm not really enraged, but I do envy them the ocean and easy friendship. I do wish I could be dumbstruck by water. I do wish someone were holding my hand. Between two fingers, one is holding a tiny sand crab. The metaphor is apparent. I would like someone to make me breakfast. I would like the ocean to be not so far away. This is not about the ocean. There's a lake three blocks from here, so huge you can't see the other shore. I could walk there now. I could put my face in the freezing water and not die. I could answer the phone. I could go tell a stranger that I resent the pretty good way I was raised. There are beautiful people all over the place. It's Sunday just past Easter. There's rebirth right around now in almost every spiritual practice, but I'm impatient and faithless. That is also a lie. I know that we are divine, but also I believe we rig our own lives. The beautiful people have packed up their picnic. The sun where they are has started to fade. They did not bring a picnic. They've written something with a stick in the sand. It's about time for a new name. <clears throat> so um, this will be a little longer, but that doesn't matter because there's no pausing for applause anyway, because we're online. Hello. 
Um, so this is an excerpt from a lyric essay called Divination and the Constant Now. We do everything we can to know the future and then avoid it. Free will is the great fuck you gift of the universe, God's big middle finger. Go figure it out, kids. I mean, something made us. We are made of something other than the gross corpus, the flesh bucket. I want to be somebody else much of the time. I just don't know who. My dad has a cancer. It probably won't kill him, but there's no way to know. I don't like that he's old. I hate other people suffering so much more than my own. I'm not selfless, it's just our family brand of martyrdom. I wouldn't wanna be immortal unless everyone else was, but that would be its own hell. Imagine what men would do if they could not die, what any of us would become. Aromancy, divination by means of atmospheric conditions. The sky is full of rock salt, my shoes, Colanders against the rain. April can fuck off like her cousins, the wind and Disney. I need some good news, not all this business of polyps, chronic fatigue, massive cardiac infarctions, anemones threaded through the flooded quarry, all the stones mentioning again that nothing fixes death. Here we are in traffic. Here we are at the deli here at the visitation, asking the same mayonnaise and white bread questions as if the graveyard were a blowfish garden, a trampoline for the rats to leap on, just some gutted neighborhood passed on the way to somewhere good. I wanted to write about the future, but the now is so now and so loved. Bless the science futurists who can dream a kind of survival for us, even if bleak. This is the old schoolhouse. Here is the church and here the post office, the old feed shop. On a corner of a post on this balcony overlooking the bay, a small American flag, hand size. I don't hate the flag. I hate its aftermath. If I could love death, Maybe I could love America. How do you hate cancer and love the body that houses it? How do you separate the grape from the wine, the wine from the grape? Divination is a process of imagining possible futures based on the perceivable now. I can love this country because I can see a future where its cancers are cut out. I can love the ailing body because no matter what dangers it houses, it is also home to the divine. The wine is inseparable from the grape, but left open too long, it all becomes vinegar. Consumed, it becomes sugar in the blood. Everything we know is in a constant and irrevocable state of transformation. Sometimes we can see the trajectory of change. Sometimes it's the dream where people are walking along the Milky Way like a tightrope, seeking escape. The bay is an estuary, part ocean, part lake. The tides move in predictable patterns for now, six hours in, 12 hours out. The oyster boats moor and float, tied to towering stakes. Macromancy, divination by means of large objects. And that's the eternal question, yes? How to divine an end when we know nothing, not even these bodies have edges, ends. On the album cover, these three men stand looking out, one almost smiling or about to say something through his beardless chin. On his t-shirt, a portal so casual, them standing in front of an apocalyptical orange sky with just a hint of horizon, America in bold print. If there's no end, then no exit, 
just rooms over Turing into rooms, skies into skies. Give me a hint, the one on the left says, his denim shirt open at the throat. Violins pick up in the distance. To follow the stars is to follow dust, I say. And what are we? What are we? Strings scraped by hairs from the tail of a horse. Tension, friction, contact, a rubbing, like the rubbing that conjured us or nothing like it at all. Plucked from a sky in zillions of skies, crouched here in death's middle distance, the man's glasses slipping infinitesimally down the bridge of his sloped nose since a minute ago, 1972. There's a photo I keep in my office, tacked to the corkboard that's older than I am by two years. The old square Kodak kind with the white frame boxing the image and a date printed on the right side, September 71. It's the kind of shot we might delete now. No one's looking at the camera, nothing remarkable is happening. Just off center in the bottom quadrant, my mom is sitting with her arm propped on a railing, her hair in two long braids. She's looking down and away from whoever is taking the picture, smiling a little, relaxed. If it's 1971, she's 19, either newly or not yet married to my dad, who's half perched on the stone wall to her left, one leg bent, facing away, looking out at what appear to be mountains in the distance. His shoulder length, wavy hair blowing back to reveal broad sideburns, the kind that start thin in the front of the ear and then widen from roughly the line of the mouth back past the earlobe in a neat line, forming a triangle of facial hair that in combination with the mustache that can barely be made out in the photo because of how his head is turned, but I know is there because it was always, has almost always been there gives him the look in this photo and others of its era of a lanky rock and roll musician, not the front man, but maybe a keyboardist or drummer. The way his bent leg parallels runs behind the line of mom's left arm says connection, conjunction, more so than if they were posed, poised, embracing for the camera they knew was watching. To dad's right is a young woman, probably my aunt, probably about 15, holding binoculars at waist level, her eyes closed, her slim body facing the camera. I love the photo for its almostness, for the sense that something happened, something occasioned them to climb to this place with a gray stone wall overlooking a forest, some fog mountains in the distance, and something, something will happen next a posed photo or just a moving on, back down to whatever's waiting at the bottom, the way I'm waiting somehow in their still bodies and my sisters, the possibility of us undiscussed, which could be what mom's thinking about looking down and is not what dad's thinking about looking out. And there's a flagpole or what appears to be a flagpole there. We can only see one stretch of it metal and lightly rusted, running from the top of the shot down past where mom is sitting. It and dad's height divide the photo into thirds. The eye is drawn organically to the flagpole first, then the white at the bottom of dad's shoe, then up to the wind blow of his hair. It must have been warm that day. And in the distance, just past his shoulder, one tree taller than all the rest, or maybe just closer. It's hard to say. Abacomancy, divination based on patterns in dust, dirt, silt, sand, or the ashes of the recently deceased. From the violin strings into the trees, all around the base of the old building, part cement, part dirt. All the arrowheads are spinning in the desert outside Albuquerque, outside Carlsbad, but no one there to see them. Square 
a danger on the horizon, a warning to the querent. This reading, this translation, nothing but the body returning to the body, resin gliding into moats unready to settle on the planed remainder of forests, the machine products of cotton stalks. Large circles, a misfortune, small, a marriage at hand. Sometimes we follow each other into history like the weather or a planet depends on it. I've gathered the dust into this bundle we can weave into blankets. But first, the stirring with a blunt stick, the way we stir a fire before sitting before it to sing. I read somewhere a long time ago that the only way to avoid death was to keep on living. Seems reasonable. And I guess the only way to go on living is to go on changing. Do you know the Steve Miller song, Dance, Dance, Dance? It was a favorite of mine growing up. The line I always remember is, I don't know, but I've been told, if you keep on dancing, you'll never grow old. Which is different from not dying, I guess, since we all know we can die young. Still, when I don't, when I don't wanna go to yoga, or do much but sit on the couch with a glass of wine, I think about how much I'd like to be able to dance at my nieces and nephews weddings if I cannot die and not get too old. Casting lots, divination by chance. I tell Abby that her friend's death is a door, which is not a lie, but I lack more detailed information. When my grandmother was still slightly alive, I stood at the foot of her bed and did what I know about moving light through a body. When I opened my eyes, I thought she was dead and wanted to take it back. She wasn't, and I didn't, and she died the next day. She'd said months before that she was ready for Jesus and Jesus was ready for her. I know that was a kind of door. Someone says, if the door doesn't open, it isn't your door, which is the kind of bullshit that keeps, keeps people from taking axes to padlocks on what keeps them from the horses they paid for. But what do I know about horses or debt? Wherever we go, so does God. So, so does death. Um, so just a brief, uh, brief poem to close. Um, uh, I'll mention real quickly um, that I uh, just um, worked it out today um, that I'm going to start running a week, uh, week not weekly, oh my God, monthly, uh, monthly reading series, um, just a featured reader and a generative writing workshop with the, um, through the Chicago Poetry Center here. And that's going to be online. Um, so everyone is welcome to join. And um, once I finish up, I'll put my website address in the little chat box and I'll have information about there that soon, but it's gonna be super fun. Um, okay, last poem. This is Disasterology, How to Survive the Apocalypse. Every day I become the horizon, don't you? The way the sky eats itself in fire or fog. I want to fold down into a nothing you can't forget. Smoke in the air long after the fire's gone. Molecules next to molecules. We're neighbors, you and I. You and the wind, me and the horizon where it bends into an envelope. I've said this before, were you listening? The thickness of the air affects how well sound travels. I don't hear very well around corners, though I can tell when a machine has been left on in a room from outside a closed door. I need you to hear this. I turned off the radio because I lost count of the dying. But if you are the sky and I am the sky and nothing but atoms between us, nothing but smoke 
or the memory of smoke, it's sent in pieces in the air. If distance is a myth and we are neighbors or the same creature, with multiple faces, breathing the common unspeakable air which has us in pieces. I'm nothing without you. Don't say it's too late to try. Thank you all so much.